So today we're concluding our series on uh, integrity. So we're going to be in Psalm chapter 15. And in this series, uh, we've, we've been talking about, I think most people want to be a person of integrity. And what we came to realize is that a person of integrity is able to live in freedom and in love. We also talked about when it's the hardest to have integrity, and that's when things are heavy or hurt. That's when it's actually needed the most. And then we talked about why we struggle to be a person of integrity, and it's because we actually don't allow our mind to be renewed. We sometimes comply and conform to things that are around us. It's not quite the same thing as being transformed. And so today we're going to conclude this series in terms of how integrity affects relationships. And in Psalm 15, it starts this way. Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? The one whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from their heart, whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to a neighbor and casts no slur on others, who despises a vile person but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps an oath even when it hurts and does not change their mind, who lends money to the poor without interest, who does not accept a bribe against, a bribe against innocent, Whoever does these things will never be shaken. So it's, it's issued in poetic language. And David is basically asking the question, who is able to be in a relationship with God? And we're a little surprised because it's not what you would think. It's not how the world generally works. It's not based on bloodline, what family you were born into. It's, it's not based on your academic achievements or accomplishments. It's, it's, it's not based on, on whether you're famous or unknown. It's not based on whether you are someone who makes things happen or you just kind of take a back seat. What it says is, is that the relationship with God is for a person of integrity person of integrity. And David kind of covers an interesting list. People who do what is right, who tell the truth from a sincere heart, who don't put others down, does not harm their neighbor, does not gossip, have no respect for persistent evildoers, have deep respect for those who show respect to God keep their word even when it costs them something. They don't try to take advantage of people who are in difficult situations and they cannot be bought. These are all integrity issues. And we all know like the lying, cheating, stealing, killing. Like we know that's integrity issues. But then there are lists in here that, that kind of surprise us. Speaking the truth from a sincere heart. Not just that what you say is true, but the heart it comes from is sincere. Not putting other people down. What would, a light, what would a day look like in our life not ever hearing anyone put down? No gossip. Being respectful. That's All of these are integrity issues too. Now when we look at this passage of Scripture, it begins to create a set of problems for us. And it has to do when we start examining ourselves compared to that list. And what happens is we tend to read Scripture from an earthbound perspective. We, we see it from our position looking up towards God rather than God's position looking down towards us. And so we assume that the only kind of person that can be in relationship with God is a person who doesn't make any mistakes, they don't fail in any way. Here's what I want you to hear. Our relationship with God is based on integrity, but it's based on God's integrity. If your perfection is what you're determining your relationship with God on, you're going to live with a lot of uncertainty in your life. Our relationship with God is what enables our integrity to grow. So we actually need help to understand this dynamic because it sounds like um, 
it sounds like somehow we're letting people off the hook. So let's take a look at a really good example where Jesus unpacked this. Because Jesus is someone who doesn't just see from an earthbound perspective. He also sees from the heavenbound perspective. And so there was an individual, a man who was an expert in spiritual things and biblical studies. And he came to Jesus and he said, I want you to tell me what's the most important commandment. Give me the priority. What's the commandment that outweighs the other commandments? because he assumed there was some level of priority. And Jesus' response is actually found in Matthew 22, where Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. This is what surprises us, real spirituality, leads to real relationships with God and with others. Real spirituality leads to real relationships with God and with others. Any other interpretation of scripture is a misinterpretation. I mean, Jesus just lays down the gauntlet and he makes it crystal clear. Real spirituality is not about how can I be more famous or more powerful or get more of what I want. Real spirituality is not about how, how I can acquire or obtain or any of those things. Real spirituality is how can I better love God and better love others. And I know you're wondering what this has to do with integrity, but there's a very important connection. Just hang with me. We're going to get there in just a second. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have been in relationship for eternity. There has never been a fight between them. In heaven, there's never been any slam doors by one of them while the other stormed out because they were upset. And Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, while they are distinct and different, have always lived in unity. So if you want to know about relationships, it makes sense that that's who we would listen to. I'll never forget one time seeing someone on television who had an ad and they were, they were talking about how to have the most fulfilling marriage ever. And so I Googled them. I wanted to find out what was the credentials of this person. And this person was on their fifth spouse. Now, if they want to sell a course on how to discard the relationship you're in and get the one you would prefer, that person is an expert. But how to have the most fulfilling relationship ever? I'm not sure that's the person to go to. God can be, you can go to God with questions about relationship because he's done it exactly right forever. And it's our relationships that weigh most heavily on us when they're not working. That's what seems to make life especially hard. There seems to be something within us that is created for community and that also ruins it at the same time. And this is why we need God. When Jesus ministered in the flesh, there was not a shortage of people who, who didn't want miracle bread. Can you imagine today if when we gathered here, we just started breaking bread and fish and just started passing it out. And even though there was just a couple of morsels on the table up front that everybody had some and there was leftover I mean, miracle bread. How many here would like to know what miracle bread tastes like? How many here believe that if you tasted miracle bread, it would change your life forever? No, it wouldn't. Oh, but if I were sick and I was healed, that would change my life forever. There were lots of people who came to Jesus and they were quite ill, sometimes critically ill to where they were not able to provide for themselves, much less anybody else. And there were miracles that occurred and, and their bodies were made whole. So did that change their lives? Please hear this. Lots of people came to Jesus and when they got what they wanted, they went back to the life they preferred. 
I wish I could tell you that if you experienced a miracle, your life would change. What I can tell you is when you experience a miracle, it will reveal what's going on in your heart and in your mind. There wasn't a shortage of people who wanted to see the power of Jesus, but there was a shortage of people who wanted to see the heart of Jesus. There were lots of people who wanted Jesus to do something for them, but there weren't that many people who just wanted Jesus. By the way, that's not changed all that much. Humans are humans. So, so in our culture, in our generation, there are lots of people who come to spiritual environments and seek God because they want their bodies to be better. They want their incomes to be better. They want their relationships to be better. They want, they want more opportunity. They want lots of things. And this is what's really interesting is when they get what they prayed for, the question is where do they go from there? The temptation is so great that there are whole sectors of Christianity that just basically say, you shouldn't ask God for those things. It's not good for you. We don't fall in that category. We think we should ask God for those things. But we also think that those things are going to reveal a lot about what's going on on the inside of us. Where are you heading? Are you heading toward Jesus or towards someone else? Your connection with Jesus isn't about perfection. Your connection with Jesus is about your direction. Where are you headed? Do you want Jesus or do you just want to use Jesus? Do you know the heart of Jesus? That's the question. When you know the heart of Jesus, you don't run from him when you get it wrong. Every one of us are going to make a mistake. Every one of us is going to make a choice that we would prefer to get out of if we could. When we make those choices, there are lots of people who see themselves as failures, as hypocrites, as weak, and they just run away from Jesus. But it's not about your perfection. It's about your direction. When you get it wrong, do you still run to Jesus? And when you get it right, when you get what you want, do you still run to Jesus? Because whatever the reason, if it moves us away from Jesus, something in our heart will get cold and it will get numb. When, G when you are in relationship with God, you can hear him assure you of who you are, that you are his child. You can hear him challenge you on things that you need to address in your life. And none of them put distance between you and God. That's because true spirituality always focuses on relationship between us and God and between us and others. God does not address our integrity issues so he can love us. He addresses our integrity issues because he loves us. He's not waiting for us to get good enough so that he can love us. The further we get from God, the harder our heart will get. And eventually it becomes very difficult to hear either the affirmations, the directions, the promptings, the corrections of God. Our integrity determines the depth of our relationships. Now, this is a really big deal because we basically believe that the depth of relationship is determined by, by style and personality. I'm sure everyone in here has some friend that just seems to make friends easier than anyone you've ever seen. Most of us, it takes a little bit more work to try to make that friend. And we assume that style and personality are, are the way that that happens. But please hear me. Style and personality are not the foundation of great relationships. Integrity is. Being the life of the party and building a life that matters is not necessarily the same thing. And so we're called to pursue spirituality correctly. Love. Love God, love others. Now, our relationships are damaged when integrity is lacking or missing. When you really love someone, you'll be honest. When you really love someone, you'll be kind. When you really love someone, you'll be generous. When you really love someone, you'll be patient. When you really love someone, you'll be tender. When you really love someone, you'll be faithful. 
If you love something or someone more than that person, eventually that gets uncovered. It gets revealed. Now, sometimes love will require you to have conversations we would prefer not to have. This is what's true for lots of, lots of people, right? This would apply to many people in the room and online this morning. We value peace and quiet over honest conversation. So when something needs to be discussed at home, we love peace and quiet more. And then things aren't addressed. They're never brought up. Or if they are, they're, they're done in kind of a sarcastic manner. What happens is our love begins to get disordered. I would prefer a quiet house to a truthful house. Disordered love is always an integrity issue, every time. Integrity isn't the absence of our failure. Integrity is the way we respond to our failure. The Bible doesn't say if you're a person of integrity, you'll never make a mistake. The Bible says that a righteous man may fall seven times, but what happens? That person gets up every time. This is what we have to come to grips with. When, when our integrity has failed to hold up under some stress or under some pressure, it's not just an accident. It was actually a choice. It was a decision we made in a moment. There's something that tends to happen. One is we feel really bad about it. We feel guilty. And we actually, our, our sense of self-worth takes a serious hit, but there's another thing that can happen too, and that is it's very easy to start blaming others for the decisions that we made. Well, I would have done the right thing, but they. And it's really easy to assume that if they had been a person of integrity, then I could be a person of integrity. That's not how it works. So when our value takes a hit and when we're tempted to blame someone else, let's, let's realize that for what it is. It's revealing an integrity issue. If you want to prove an integrity, focus on relationships. We tend to focus on rules. If you want to improve an integrity, focus on relationships. If you loved God, how would you respond in this situation? Great question. And then take action on that. If you loved another person, how would you respond in this situation? And then take action. Now the psalm ends with a surprise. It spends all this time talking about who can be in relationship with God, but then it tells us that there's a benefit to the person that learns to be in relationship with God. It says, you will not be shaken. Um, there's a lot being shaken in our world right now. And I wish that I could tell you that the church has been unshakable. But with all the tension that's going on in our world, some of what has been revealed is that some of the things that God's people have been standing on are not so much about God, but other things that have served them really well. He says, if your focus is on relationship with God, you will not be shaken. He does not say you will always be spared of challenging situations or painful situations. Christianity is not about how to avoid all the painful things in life. Christianity is about how to approach everything in life with firm footing. If all you do is try to avoid pain, I can predict your future with a terrifying sense of accuracy. And by the way, you can be pretty manipulated by other people. This is not the life God has called us to. He doesn't promise us there'll never be challenges. He says you will not be shaken. A person with integrity isn't looking for a way out of the problem. A person with integrity is looking for a way 
through the problem. And that's what God has called us to be. For those who think that spirituality is just easy and an easy way out, a, a kind of way to avoid the realities of life, then what I would suggest if, is they've not really taken much of Scripture all that seriously. They've limited it to a couple of rules, and by their own assessment, they do that reasonably well. Or because life is working well for them right now, they assume they have all of that going for them. And what God says is something quite different. And there'll be moments when you need this. I'm going to ask the worship team to come out. There'll be moments when you need to know that just because your world is falling around you doesn't mean that God has forsaken you. We need to know that when something is hard, that there's something inside of us that's stronger than we realized. And there's someone who is whispering to us that we can manage this situation in a way that shows our love for God and our love for others. It doesn't mean people will always be happy with you. But learning to live out of integrity makes the kinds of relationships strong and healthy in a way that you'll know this is how you were designed to live. So let's just bow our heads right now. Heavenly Father, um, the simple truth is that we've all failed and we're reminded of that, not only from our own thoughts and our own heart, but also by others. They, they remind us of the things that we didn't get right. And it's pretty easy to get down on ourselves and assume that you don't have much use for people like us. Would you help us see today that our capacity to be in relationship with you is not because we have all the integrity, but because you do. And it's your love that reached out to us while we were flailing and thrashing and running and falling and you found a way your spirit whispered to our heart and we heard it and we moved towards you and now father we give you permission speak to our hearts affirm that we belong to you and challenge those things that would erode our relationship with you or with someone else Help us learn how to walk forward in a way that honors you and others. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.